This is the Puck Poolies Podcast with Matt Larkin and Stephen Ellis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of Puck Poolies. As always, it's Matt Larkin here with Stephen Ellis. And I got nothing to add about my fantasy team. We know that, Stephen. I'm out of it. Other than the fact that Michael Buble is in the damn final now, which sucks. It's gonna be, he said if he wins, he's going to take out a full-page ad in a newspaper, which I believe him. Uh, but I am, I'm a hamster owner now, Stephen. That's what's changed about, about me since the last episode, uh, which I figured was relevant because we, we ranked pets. But over to you, my friend. What's going on in your league? Well, I, I saw a picture of the hamster, so that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not feeling so good today, so if I sound a bit off, that's, that's what's happening. Uh, in terms of fantasy, I didn't participate in any of my fantasy battles last week, but I'm already off, uh, obviously, to the semifinals this week due to uh, a bye, and it's already looking terrible. I'm playing the team that came fourth place. I really needed a goalie because I was I was already right off the bat with Demko hurt and no other injury so i couldn't i i was really scared about dropping somebody and then that biting me in the butt but i needed another goalie i picked up a noon and out of colorado i'm thinking okay they sh- should be able to be the columbus blue jackets they did not uh and then uh i dropped more at cider to make it happen because he's my worst defenseman more at cider went on to get like 21 points in fantasy last night so oh, um that hurt. I'm already losing. I'm still projected to win, but uh, yeah, I, I do want to give a, a, a call out though to one of the guys that play against Mariano, who was very, very confident this year he was going to come at least second. Um, he is currently losing to a team that gave up about two or about a month and a half ago, who just really <laughs> stopped setting their lines because he was trying to tank, and he's losing them right now. So uh, I have to call him out for being really bad. But uh, right now, actually, there's a chance that we could see three underdogs. Uh, win one one come in fifth place and the other two going to the final um, that is shocking to me but I guess when you also don't play fantasy for a week and you're not picking guys up and you're not making these active moves like that could put you at a disadvantage kind of like when you like Canada used to win uh, enough games during the world juniors to get to the semifinal automatically through a bye and then they would get killed because they've just been sitting around doing nothing for a few days there's mm-hmm. maybe that's what's happening here yeah, and there's there is the luck factor, and and it is a point of debate in my own league where there's one GM who he doesn't make major trades for picks because he doesn't care about the playoffs because he says the regular season means more than the playoffs in our league because he says well if you're the best team for 22 weeks you deserve to be the champion, and if you lo- if you have one bad week and get eliminated then who cares so like that which is I don't agree with it's okay it's it's. It happened in the real life too. The Boston Bruins had 65 wins. They lost in the playoffs. You got to be good every week. Uh, and I like that fantasy can replicate that in head to head, but it, it is tough. Like last week, we had a team that was so dominant all year long, like one of the best teams we've ever had in our league. I think he won 20 weeks in a row and he lost in the semifinals. He just had that one bad week and he was so upset. It does happen, you know, but it's just, it's, it's, it's the way things go in the head to head format. Uh, but well, I'll, I'll say to add to that there in, in NASCAR a couple of years ago, the well, a decade now ago, I guess they changed the playoff format that they had where it was like win and you're in to the next round type thing. And that means that in theory, a guy could win 35 races out of 36 could lead every lap of that final race, except for the very last lap. The guy in second can pass him. And if that guy's in the championship four, he could win the championship and he might've just done nothing the rest of the season. That's just kind of how that happens. And I feel like that's going to potentially happen here in fantasy hockey in my, my league. Man, oh man, that's crazy. Wow. Wow. Well, we do have some listeners who are still alive and depending on the league, some leagues might be in their final, some leagues might be in their semis or earlier in the playoffs, but I think everybody's in the playoffs or if you're in Roto, you're in the home stretch. So let's try to help some people and talk pickups. If you're in Roto, you're you're probably still asleep. Um, shallow pickup, Dylan Strom. Yeah, 62% available, and we're at the juncture of the season where every pickup can't be sexy anymore. It can't always be the Logan Cooley or someone who's really exciting. Sometimes you just need someone who's boring and, more importantly, who plays four times, which the Washington Capitals do this week. And they have so much to play for. They're in this dogfight for a playoff spot, whether it's a wild card spot in the East or even that third rung in the Metro bracket, stealing it from the Philadelphia Flyers. It's kind of going to be back and forth between those two spots. And 
He's on the second line right now. It's been Connor McMichael playing up with Ovechkin, but Dylan Strom is the first line power play center. And when it comes to Ovechkin, that's the that's the role that matters. Whether you're his first line center or his power play center, it's the power play center you really want to be. That's his bread and butter. Dylan Strom, 10 points in his last seven games. And to me, just, just with the four-game slate, he needs to be owned in every single league if you're still alive. All right. I like that one. This one's still a personal favorite of mine that I love to see how good of a year he's having. Jonathan drew in everything he went through and, you know, wasn't even clear if he was going to be an NHL player in the long run to have this type of season he's had. He's been very valuable for me in fantasy. I like seeing him on this list. Yeah, and he sort of uh, emblemizes why you have to be reactive in fantasy. So at the beginning of the season, everybody was out or maybe in the offseason. Then he signs. Oh, he could play with McKinnon. Everybody's in. Slow start. Everybody's out. Then catches fire for a long time. Everybody's in. Then he's off that top line. Everybody's out. And now he's back on the top line with Nathan McKinnon, Miko Ranton, and he's got 14 points in his last 11 games. And to me, whenever he's on that line, we have to treat him as a top end forward. He is probably going to have the best overall statistical line of his career by the time this season's done. He's already got 15 goals, 48 points in just over 70 games. Uh, tremendous comeback year for Mr. Durant. And uh, again, it's to me, it's it's yes, he his value is very line mate dependent, but every time he's on that line, you just have to adjust your expectations and treat him as a priority pickup. It also kind of shows you how important those filters are on specifically the Yahoo app where you can pick not just by the whole season stats, but you can look at the last 30 days and last 14 days. And I would say like in because of how shallow my one league is, I would really kind of just look at the full season long thing. It's like, okay, like these are the guys that of the ones that are still left. These are the guys that have been just statistically better, but then you miss out on guys like Jonathan drew and going out there and having these really good stretches where he's going to get you more points in a short span than Jake McCabe is type thing. So, yes. And that's a good point. And that's going to come into play uh, later, just only a few minutes from now when we talk about the WTF pickup, but that's a very important principle in terms of uh, overlooking short uh, hot streaks and shorter samples. So we'll get to that, but let's do the deep league pickup next. All right. And that is Dylan Gunther, the obviously the team Canada, the world junior hero two years ago and the Arizona Coyotes player. Yes, at the mere mention of his name, our colleague Mike Gold, I think, just suddenly sat up in bed and didn't know why. Uh, Dylan Genther, available 92% of leagues. And you look at the stat line, 12 goals, 24 points in 37 games, 82 game pace there would be 27 goals, 54 points, 206 shots for someone who hasn't even played a full season yet in the NHL. Six goals, 12 points in his last 15 games. And we know Dylan Gunther was a great junior player, first-round pick, world junior. He checks all those boxes in terms of prospect pedigree. We know he's going to be a very interesting goal scorer in the NHL. He's playing the point on the first power play unit. So just the overall role and opportunity he has over this final chunk of time in the season is pretty nice. And for a player that's available in that many leagues, there aren't many guys out there. If you're scouring the wire in a really deep league, and you're even just struggling to find someone who even gets power play time. Well, Dylan Genther is available in most leagues, and he's someone who has a really plum role, and he could easily give you five more goals between now and the end of the season. Okay, I like that one a lot. And uh, Nick Suzuki, actually, it's funny. I was literally looking to pick him up about 15 minutes ago. Yes, so he's the WTF pickup available somehow in 27% of leagues. And this goes to the principle you're talking about, Stephen. If you're in a more casual league where you're looking at surface stats, you might overlook someone like Suzuki who's good. He's not a, an elite player, but his numbers has been good. Except if you break down that sample, in the last 28 games, he's got 18 goals, 32 points. So in the last third of a season, give or take, he has been an elite fantasy player. And to me, he's actually reached a level I didn't know he necessarily had in him i know he always projected to be a good two-way center he's the captain of course he's a smart player i thought he was going to kind of top out as maybe a 25 goal 70 point guy but he's showing a higher ceiling than i thought he had in him especially anyone who's capable of scoring 18 goals in a 28 game stretch it's not like that's a five game hot streak that's a significant change in his ceiling and there might be some some guys with better overall numbers on the season who aren't producing as much. And I think you have to, in a shallow league, in, in any other league, Suzuki's going to be owned. But if you're in a shallow league like yours, Stephen, I think you got to pounce on Nick Suzuki and treat him more like a top 30 player for the rest of the season. 
I, you know, I think Habs fans are on one hand, they're pretty happy that Suzuki's having as good of a year as he is. On the other hand, are saying, please stop having as good of a year uh, right now. It's so close, like the fifth, sixth, seventh in the in the uh, draft lottery rankings, which you can see at dailyfaceoff.com, by the way, um, that uh, it's. I feel like they probably just please, please start losing some games. Samuel Montebo, stop being really good at what you do. And uh, that's not going to work. Now, this one's very interesting. I'm going to read my interpretation of, of what your thing here is. Use a schedule to break ties and matchup decisions. I, I'm assuming you guys are then like looking at, uh, okay, well, you know, we got two guys tied. We're going to go and find like a local rink that's got like a 1130 PM time slot. And we're going to see if they got an open ice slot and, and, and try to see who can win in a one-on-one battle. So is that what you're talking about here? I wish that would be pretty sweet. Uh, no, but it's not nearly that exciting. It's just we're in the time of year where you really have to grind out every tiny little advantage you can get if you want to win, especially in head to head. And it, it does apply to Roto as well if you're trying to catch up in categories. And, and at this point, most of the time, I'm very much a proponent of bet on talent. I don't really, I try not to ride the line deployments too much because they change so much. Usually, if you have the better players over the course of the season, you're going to do better. But when we're this close to the end, I think I'll use an example for you. If you have the Vegas Golden Knights who have two games on the fantasy slate versus the Washington Capitals who have four, you need to start Connor McMichael over Jack Eichel. You need the four games of someone who's in a first-line role on a desperate team over a really good, almost superstar-level center who only has two games. So at this point in the year, you have to be ruthless and be willing to drop a really good player for that increased volume. You need four more kicks at the can, not two. If you're trying to put your team over the top. So if you're just kind of weighing decisions, I think you have to use the schedule and the number of games as a very important tiebreaker. Okay. I like that one. Although my idea was a lot better, I think. So uh, <laughs> what's our uh, special segment today? Okay. Sorry. I'm sipping water because uh, my wife and kids tickled me last night and I'm so ticklish that I was like screaming and I lost my <laughs> voice. Uh which sounds weird. It sounds I don't. It sounds very strange. It doesn't happen all the time. They just, sure. they take, they tickle me. Sure. Uh, okay. Yes. Our special segment today. We're going to look at breakouts because we're getting close to the end of the fantasy hockey calendar, which means we're running out of chances to sort of look ahead to next year. And I want to just hint at some players we'll be reaching on next season in drafts. Some of them are obvious. Some of them are not. But they all have a, a I think a purpose for being included on this list. So let's talk about breakouts and more specifically. Guys that I'm going to reach an extra round or two on next year. All right. Well, let's start off with a guy that no one's ever heard of before, and that is Connor Bedard. <laughs> yes, Connor Bedard, as I put in brackets, lol, lols with a Z, lols. But I'll explain why he counts as a breakout. Everyone knows he's been very good. He's been almost a point per game as a rookie, but I think it's actually masking how good he's been and how much better he's going to be next year. I've hinted at it on the show before, but I'm going to do it a little bit more specifically here. So there are two 18-year-olds in the past 37 years who have averaged more points than Connor Bedard this season in the NHL. They are Sidney Crosby and Connor McDavid. That just tells you the company he's keeping. As I've said before, both of those players had that level in the rookie season. Both of those players went absolutely supernova in year two. Both of those players won the Hart and the Art Ross in year two. The competition, of course, is really steep. For Bedard, I'm not saying he's going to win the Art Ross because he's overlapping with McDavid still in his prime. But I think we are going to see something like 45, 50 goals, 100, 105 points from Connor Bedard in year two. I think he's going to be a first round caliber player next season based on what he's shown already. Also very important, the Blackhawks are committed to making a much better team next year. We know they're going to add another significant piece. It could be Max, Macklin Celebrini. We don't know who it's going to be, but it's going to be an impact player at the draft this year, depending on how the draft lottery balls play out. You have Frankie Nazar. Nazar? Nazar? Nazar. Nazar. I call him Nazar. Yeah. Yep. So there's a chance that he'll be turning pro. Add him to the frame next year. You're going to get someone like Kevin Korczynski getting better. The supporting cast is going to get better. We already know the Chicago Blackhawks. It's been implied, reported by our own Frank Cervalli that they might be more aggressive in the offseason too, in pursuing upgrades. I know it's something, Stephen, you've been really suggesting they do. Uh, so if you add up all those factors, developmentally, Connor Bedard is on this very similar path to Crosby and McDavid, and he's on a team that's going to, I think, be much better next year in terms of the supporting cast around him. He's already doing this with absolutely no one helping him. 
So next year, I think you're going to see a huge jump. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't rank him 30th. I think he could be a top 15 player next year, and I'm okay with anyone who wants to reach, even take him near the end of the first round next year. The Blackhawks should have gone all in on Jake Gensel this year. Uh, they have seven picks in the first three rounds. Why not just use some of them? Uh, they've got two first rounders in each of the next two drafts. Uh, it's a while before they go get out of the top three rounds without significantly more picks than they started with. So I thought they should have been a bit more aggressive at the deadline, but whatever. Uh, the second one here is Shane Pinto, a guy that nobody was picking at the start of the year because he wasn't playing. But now that he's playing and playing very well, I like this one. Yeah, it's been an interesting uh, trajectory for Shane Pinto, who a couple of years ago was a pretty popular prospect uh, coming through the college route. I think North Dakota, wasn't he North Dakota? Same school, same yep. school as Jonathan Tapes. And of course, the value went in the toilet, uh, especially this year, the gambling scandal. And it's really fascinating what's happened. And it wasn't just because of the Josh Norris injury. Even before the injury, we saw Shane Pinto overtaking him on the depth chart, taking over as the number two center. And now Norris has not just been hurt again, but it's another shoulder injury. So his future is very much in flux. And I think Shane Pinto is positioned to permanently leapfrog Norris in the pecking order. Uh, and I just think he's shown a lot of promise shooting the puck roughly three times a game, 25 points in 32 games. Project that over a full season. It's close to, give or take, a 60-point player. And yes, Ottawa, they perennially perennially disappoint, but uh, they're not necessarily disappointments in fantasy. So I think that Pinto is primed for a career year next year. I could see him getting 25 goals, 65 points, something like that. Yep. I, I like that one. Like Pinto, I've been a big fan of since they drafted him, a guy that knows how to shoot, knows how to win face-offs, knows how to just be so effective, both ends of the ice. He's dealt with injuries, obviously getting suspended this year didn't help, but I think that when he's healthy, he's he's one of the best young guys the Ottawa Senators have, and that's good because you know their rebuild hasn't exactly worked the way they were kind of hoping it would, but Pinto is starting to look like the guy we knew he could be. So if Josh Norris can't ever stay healthy anymore, that's a bummer, but you know Shane Pinto's looking there. Remember a couple of years ago we were talking about Colin White, like just how good he could have been for the Senators. Had this great, you know, forty-one point season that one year, and I was like, well, let's see what he could do. And now it's like, I think he's on Montreal right now. So yeah, Colin White when he was coming up the college ranks uh, was compared by a lot of people to Patrice Bergeron in terms of his like skill set, what what people hoped he was going to be, but it has not played out that way. It's a mystery what happened because, again, the talent was there. I just I don't know what happened. Thomas Harley, we've talked about him a few times on this show, but uh, a guy that I think we both think could potentially be in the Four Nations face-off roster consideration for Team Canada next year. Yes, Thomas Harley. And wait, before I get to Thomas Harley, I want to tell a really weird story about Colin White because it just sounds like I dreamt this. But when he was a rookie, uh, I did a story when I was with Hockey News uh, interviewing a bunch of the Sens rookies. But Ottawa, which was funny, had the idea for me to interview them all at the same time. So it was me in a closed room with Colin White, Brady Kachuk, Max Lajoie, and then Thomas Cheval was a sophomore at the time. And I don't know why we were talking about the floss and who could do the floss dance. And, and they, all, they all said, Whitey. And then Colin White got up and the rest of us just sat there in the silent room while Colin White did the floss. <laughs> it was really weird. But uh, it was memorable, so I just wanted to share that. Um, okay. <laughs> it was so weird. But I gained respect for Colin White. Okay, Thomas Harley. So, obviously, he's been already one of the breakout players of the year. 15 goals, 40 points. He's playing with Mira Heiskin. He's showing so much promise. Five on five, plus 20 goal differential with him out there. This kid is a stud. And, yes, you could argue the breakout's already happened. But to me, it's like, well, this is just him getting his feet wet and establishing himself as a full-time NHLer. Like, is this the floor? Uh, Dallas, we know, is a powerhouse. They're set up to continue to be a powerhouse for years to come because now they're graybeards. You know, Tyler Sagan, Jamie Benn, those guys are now the secondary group. And you have their superstars, Jason Robertson, Heiskanen. You have Jake Jake Otten, Jarupe Hintz. You have Logan Stankoven, Wyatt Johnson. This team is stacked, man. And Thomas Harley is going to be a big part of that. Super fertile fantasy environment. First round pedigree. He just has everything going for him. And I think we could see him become an elite fantasy defenseman next year. Yep, I really like that one. I, I was not super high on Harley when he was a Mississauga Steelhead. I just wasn't sure he had a huge, super high ceiling. 
I'm glad that he's looking as good as he is, though, because, you know, that just makes the Dallas Stars even more fun to watch, like with how much talent that team has and how they continue to find these, you know, defensive stalwart guys. And one that I'm not sure how confident they were in, in him for a couple of years, but the way he's playing this year, it's like that confidence in himself. It's it's there 100. Mm-hmm. percent uh, Next up, a guy that again I'm so happy is looking as good as he is, Marco Rossi. Just because, you know, I know it's been a few years now, but that COVID loss season that was a huge bummer for him, given how much momentum he was carrying from that great OHL season. But now, just after a couple of years in the AHL, that just wasn't really working. He's looked pretty good this year. He's actually been one of the best rookies the Minnesota Wild have ever had. That's right, and I agree. It's fun that we get to talk about him as someone to be bullish on because. He obviously spent several years appearing on kind of sleeper lists or long-term keeper lists, but he wasn't putting it all together. Finally got an extended look in the NHL last year. It was an unmitigated disaster. He could just could not find the net. Didn't look NHL ready when he got a shot, despite looking good in the preseason. And then this year, it finally just sticks. 20 goals as a rookie. Very exciting. And he's shown some good two-way ability, which is great. Great way to earn your coach's trust. And if you look at the long-term setup for the Wild, yes, Joel Erickson Eck having a career year, and yes, Ryan Hartman has often been the center for Kirill Kaprizov, but I still think the Wild's hope long-term has always been that Marco Rossi can be their number one center and play with Kaprizov. And he's had some opportunities to do that this year. And based on what he's shown as a rookie in his first full year, I think he's on the path now to becoming that player for them. So I think there's potential for him to make a major leap next year. So he's a 20-goal player this year, but he could be a 30-goal player. He could be a 65-point, 70-point player next year if things break his way. So good on you, Marco. It's nice to see you on your feet and with all the crazy health stuff behind you now. Offensively, he's been quite inconsistent, and I wrote about him in my recent Calder update mm-hmm. where he, I think he only had four points last year or last month. It was a quiet month for him. The big thing going forward for him is just continuously improving his two-way play because that was something where – when he was drafted, you know, a small guy wasn't very physical. How was he going to get around that? And a lot of it was, you know, just how good he was at both ends of the ice. And he's already looking fantastic in that regard there. So he does a lot of things that don't get rewarded on the score sheet. And eventually the score sheet stuff will show up. Um, he showed last year in the AHL that he wasn't just a junior point producer. He could produce at the po- uh, the pro level too. So I like his future there. I'm a big fan of him and I'm happy to see him playing as well as he has. Uh, and then to finish it off, let's go with Quinton Byfield. Yeah, this one is really interesting to me um, because the pedigree with Byfield, the hype when he was first a prospect in that 2020 draft class, even back then it was sort of like, okay, this kid is really raw. He has a really wide range of outcomes. He could be a bust, but he could also be Eric Lindros and it's going to take him time to sort of find himself. And of course we had that freak broken ankle uh, at the beginning of the season a couple years back. That set him back on his developmental timeline. But he finally stuck as a first-line player last year. I wasn't that high in him going into the year because he had one of those kind of like Robert Thomas, Mark Stone profiles where he doesn't shoot the puck that much, doesn't register that many hits, he's going to be a source of assists, but that's all he was really showing. And that kind of was how the year started, which is why in the Keeper League I actually traded him away. Um, But he sort of found the beast now. And I think we're starting to see that major potential be realized. He's shooting the puck a lot more now, roughly a couple shots per game, close to a hit per game. He's broken out as a first line player, but now it's like, wait, is Quinton Byfield going to become a superstar? I think it's still in play. And if you look at players like Joe Thornton or Vincent LeCavalier or Todd Bertuzzi back in the day, these big, big guys that just took a while to grow into their bodies. It's more common, that's the adage for defensemen like Chara, Pronger, Hedman, but it applies to some really big guys uh, who are forwards too. And I feel like Byfield is growing into his body now and maybe the sky's the limit. Like this guy could be a point per game player. I'm thinking 80 point player next year for the Kings. Yeah, I'm a big fan. And, you know, I got to see the OHL Cup um, this past weekend and there's a prospect that kind of has a very similar build to him and that is Ethan Belchett who Oakville Rangers player he just won the tournament and uh, a lot of scouts were kind of saying there's some similarities there and how they you know physically were just a dominant player that age group I guess the big question is how do you take that to the next level where everyone else is typically a little stronger than you know a 16 year old or anybody in the OHL and uh, I think that it took Byfield a bit to figure that out but um 
he was one of the best under 16 players I'd ever seen. And that's just because nobody wanted to go near him. And now that he's figuring how to use that to his advantage, uh, it looks pretty good. You had two bonus picks here. Who were they? Yes. So if we're just looking ahead, it's something just to kind of uh, make a note of uh, in terms of goalies to reach on next year, depending on how the offseason plays out. So if the Calgary Flames trade Jacob Markstrom, make sure you're all in on Dustin Wolf. And if the Nashville Predators trade UC Saros, make sure you're all in on Yaroslav Askarov. Or if the Nashville Predators trade Yaroslav Askarov, make sure you're all in on Yaroslav Askarov. I think it's becoming less and less likely that the Predators trade Saros just based on how they've surged in the second half. But just keep an eye on those two goalies, Wolf and Askarov. They're two of the best goalie prospects in the world. And I just think there's a nice opportunity for their roles to change. Another one, of course, to, to remember is Jesper Wallstedt in Minnesota. If Marc-Andre Fleury retires after the season, which is entirely possible, it's going to be Wallstedt's net to share with Gustafson. He's also an elite goalie prospect. So just keep those names in mind. As you said before, Stephen, we're in a really nice age, a really major surge of high, high, high end goalie prospects right now. So these guys could be big time different difference makers if they uh, get the right opportunities. I'll throw one totally crazy wild card out there with Detroit and, and their kind of crazy goalie situation. What about Sebastian Cosa as a backup next year? You never mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, uh, he's having a good year this year. I'm, I'm really happy to see that. So, I love seeing goalies do well. Um, I like seeing all prospects do well, actually. There's nobody I want to see fail, but uh, there's that. Uh, who's our guest? Okay, it's been a while since we brought our buddy Dom Lustician on from The Athletic. So, let's get Dommy on to talk. Okay, everybody, we're very happy to bring back one of our favorite guests, our buddy from The Athletic. It's Dom Lustician. Dom, before I say hello, I just got to tell you something, okay? Last week, I was watching Catch Me If You Can, and they showed some scenes of the, long, the young Leo DiCaprio, and I was like, oh, my God, it's Dom. So I'm curious, before we get into oh the fantasy, God. have you ever been told that, that you look like a young Leonardo DiCaprio? I want to know. Once. Uh, it was a comment uh, under a Facebook profile photo of high school. And one of my friends just put LMAO to the person commenting that. So um, I think you're just buttering me up for a good podcast. That's all it is. Okay. I'll take it every day of the week. And it was because it was a flashback scene so that they combed Leo's hair down. So into the current style you have. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, like, dumb. Oh, shit, it's dumb. Uh, so I was curious. Okay. So, uh, Dom, we're, we're... <laughs> that was a curveball, wasn't it? A little curveball? Yeah. Did not expect that at all. Know. I needed that. Uh, good stuff. My worst one, I used to get Ricky from Trailer Park Boys. I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> my most common one is actually Travis Kelsey, though, because it just, I, you know, you I, can't, I, look, you can't see, you can never see my eyes when I smile and my eyebrows. I, I know your hair doesn't look like Kelsey's at all, but like when you have the hat on, I see the vision. I see the vision now. Mm -hmm. And the similarities end there. Although we've probably had the same number of concussions. Okay. <laughs> same salary though, right? Yes, of course. Of course. So we're at the stage of the fantasy season, Dom, where we're kind of taking stock, right, of predictions and just everything that we expected going into the year. So I'm curious for you, who, who or what is your biggest disappointment of the fantasy season so far? Immediately, my mind goes to the entire city of Buffalo. Like, <laughs> they were one of the most exciting teams. Last year, they had a crazy good power play. They had so many weapons. And this year, everyone stinks. Um, I think the biggest name that comes to mind is Dylan Cousins, who, before the season, I remember my model was a little lower than I think some other people. And what me and Shana do for our projections is we put a little plus sign if we think a player is going to be a little better, maybe like a sleeper or something to like up their projections. And we put like two for Cousins. We're like, this guy's going to be, this is a, like, forget last year's going to break out even more than that or something like that. He'll be a huge weapon. And he was a huge bust instead. I don't think he even played power play one for most of the year. And it didn't matter because he just, anytime he was there, he didn't do anything. And I remember I traded for him. Um, I think around December, thinking that he would maybe break out the slump, buy low candidate, and he just immediately stunk. And I think I cut my losses after like two weeks and picked up Buchnevich instead and just sold uh, one of the lower teams that 
Cousins could be a keeper. He's young. He'll probably be better next year. I mm-hmm. I would believe in him to bounce back next year, but this year he's just a fantasy bum. That's it. That's all you can say. To kind of throw you another curveball here, uh, who's better at fantasy, you or Scott Wheeler? Uh, I will definitely say me. I think Scott has a lot of strengths, and I think he brings those to the table in fantasy, which is he can identify the young guys. He will pick those guys up and can build that way. I just think for the way our keeper format is set up, he is going to get lost in the way that a lot of fantasy managers get lost in keeper leagues, which is, oh, let's get all the young guys. And then you keep cycling through young guys and you keep putting yourself into this perpetual rebuild when like he had Matthew Kachuk, he had Panarin and he had Stutzla. Like if you want your young, like the fact he traded Stutzla as well to get someone who is a lot worse. I don't know. I, I get what he's doing. Respect Scott because the way the keepers work is you keep them from the draft slot and he's got Faber in like round 16 and McTavish in round 14 or something like that. So that makes perhaps more sense than Stutzla in round three or four, but in terms of like absolute ceiling, if you want to have a good team, like I just, I think there's still value in, in those guys with where you drafted them. I've enjoyed the banter between you guys on Twitter about <laughs> your fantasy league. So I've been following that. Um, but I guess for those that are still alive in the playoffs, like myself included, uh, how do you alter your roster management strategy at this time of year? Um, you really just have to maximize games played as much as possible. Like, to an extent, you don't want to drop someone who's, like, actually good, but you want to have at least one, I guess, roster spot ready to go for a streamer. And in my league, the big thing is maximizing goalie starts because we do the correct thing of only having one goalie starter, as it should be for every single league. And I will will vouch for that. Like, think about it for the NFL. You absolutely laugh at anyone in a two-quarterback league because it's stupid. We've 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 been through this before. I'm not taking the bait this time. <laughs> Should right? be one goalie, and uh, sometimes the uh, you get a lot of goalie starts overlapping on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So picking up the right goalie on Monday, Wednesday, Friday is key. And for me, it never works. Um, for my friend who is currently in first by eight points in this uh, final, he picks up the dumbest goalies and they just get him 10 points like every time and i i hate him for it last night he picked up fabian zetterland to two point night 10 points in our league bum hate him i'm i'm so <laughs> rattled because like i have the obvious best team in this league and he is just doing the weirdest things and it's just working for him i told him to buy a lottery ticket because it just doesn't make sense interesting I don't want to take the bait, but I'm just going to say, in a two-quarterback league, the team that has Kenny Pickett struggles. That makes sense. It feels like real life. I'm just going to leave it at that. The team that has a superstar quarterback, the team that has Josh Allen, is good. It doesn't devalue the position that produces the most impactful players in real life. Anyways. You, no, here's the thing. It doesn't de- – like, Josh Allen's, like, already, like, an elite fantasy option. The team that has Josh Allen in a one quarterback league usually is at the top of the league because they have Josh Allen. It doesn't devalue anything. It just means you don't have to draft Kenny Pickett. Like, this is <laughs> stupid to have him on your team. <laughs> but it's funny. It's funny when there's a team with Kenny Pickett in our league. It's really funny. I think it's even objectively. I think it's even dumber in hockey because you have, you end up having to start like both goalies like all the time and then. To maximize goalie starts, you need a third goalie. So you're drafting like 40 goalies in this league. And I don't know, it just doesn't make sense. In a one goalie league, you still have your two goalies, but one of them is an actual backup and you have your starter. And I think it just makes a lot more sense because you still have the the Alex Lyons of the world on some team. And you're still struggling if you have that guy. But it just it makes it so goalies are not as important for fancy purposes as... And that's how it should be because they are so random and can decide any single matchup that if you double the amount that you need, it just, like, you're screwed. Even if you have, like, like I have Connor Hellbuck and Stuart Skinner as my goalies. And if I was in a two-goalie league, I would be screwed with my supposedly elite goalies that have been great 
for Hellbuck all season for Skinner since November. They've been amazing. If I was in a two-goalie league, I'd be screwed right now because they have been so bad in the playoffs. And they, like, goaltending just doesn't matter. Even if you have good ones, it doesn't matter why add more value to it in a league. That's my position. It's interesting, too. Or, or you could be like Miley, which is technically a four-goalie league where you'd have Hellebuck and Brassois as one duo, and then you'd have <laughs> you'd have Skinner and Calvin Pickard. So, you know, there's different ways to do this. Honestly, that's better because then you just mm -hmm. have, a t you have the team goalie. That, that's fine to me because you don't get into the weeds of needing, like, a quality backup as your third guy. You just have two teams. And then if you want to have a third team, fine. I guess that makes sense. But... Eventually, you run out of teams, and if you have the the Sharks as a team, you're screwed. But I like that a lot more than, than two goalies starting. Yeah, we switched. It must have been right after you left our league that we made that switch. We yeah. became the team goalie league. Okay, so looking ahead to next year, as we talked about Dylan Cousins, you hinted maybe he's someone who could bounce back. But I'm curious, just thinking about actual breakouts for next year, Who's someone, we'll start with a forward, that you're willing to reach on, that you could see yourself reaching on when it's draft season next September? Yeah, so every draft, one of my main strategies is looking at player ages and looking at those breakout, the breakout bucket, which is around like 21 to 25. And if they haven't done it yet, like I'll put a bit more emphasis on those guys. So like I look quickly and the other thing is like draft pedigree, if they're like a top 10 pick and they haven't done it. So I was big on Mason McTavish last draft, and he looked like a fantastic pick to start, and then he sort of trailed off. I luckily traded him at when his value was at a high. But I I mean, I like him again, probably a lot of ducks. I think at some point you think the talent level on that team is going to click. And I like McTavish a lot. I think he is, to me, the big breakout candidate, because you've already seen what uh what zegris can do i don't know how much more ceiling there is unless he goes somewhere else that would be nice um but uh yeah mctavish i also wrote down maddie Beneers. i imagine that his rookie year was probably his peak value this year is his like floor value mm -hmm. and if you guess that is the range and you think he's going to break out then he's probably breaking out above that peak so I think he has a big bounce back potential. And then obviously Slavkovsky has been fantastic in the second half. You gotta you gotta draft him at some point, probably higher than, than someone else will. You'd probably be very happy you did. Good. Uh well to kind of just keep on the same uh, trend here. What about a defenseman? Honestly, same idea. Uh Minchikov, I think, started like pretty good, but mm -hmm. tailed off. That situation is is tricky because you have no idea who's going to be Anaheim's power play one quarterback. And even if they are, the power play stinks. So you just have to hope that a lot of things fall into place for Anaheim where the power play starts figuring out the forwards start getting better. And then if they do, whoever's in that spot is the guy to go for. And I think it should be Minchikov, could be Zellweger, could be Fowler, although that would be a mistake because they've had yeah. a decade of Fowler not <laughs> doing anything why not give it to one of the young guys um another guy who has that potential i think is kevin korchinski if you think seth jones might be slotted better as a in a shutdown pair and maybe ease his minutes in an offensive role maybe put korchinski on that top power play unit i think he showed he can do that in junior he had a lot of growing pains as a rookie but he obviously has the talent level and the puck moving ability that I think he can really thrive in that role. And if he's the guy feeding Connor Bedard power play one timers, that's a, a pretty valuable thing to have in the, in fantasy hockey. I like those picks. And it's funny earlier in the show, I, I picked Thomas Harley. Um, mm -hmm. But I also just realized I should have, I should have recommended Bowen Byram as well, but just based on how much his role has grown, like his ice time has increased by five, six minutes <laughs> since he went <laughs> yeah. to Buffalo. So he could easily, if he's healthy, get 50 points next year. Um, Okay, let's hear, this is the toughest one, I think, because goalies are just voodoo and it's impossible to predict who's going to be the next breakout. But if you have to pick one, who is your goalie breakout for next year? Uh, yeah, that, this was the toughest one, but I think there's like one obvious candidate. Uh, with goalies, you want a good situation where you think they'll start a lot of games. You want them to be a, on a good team where you think they'll win a lot of games. And I, I think the, the best candidate for that is Joseph Wall. I... 
I'm not sure what happens to Samsonov after this year as he signed or RFA, UFA. I'm not sure. But Wall looked like he had the net until he got injured. And since then, he's not been very good. But put a, a summer under his belt, a bit more support. And I think he can be the longtime Leaf starter. And that makes him, I think, the best candidate uh, in Calgary. There's Dustin Wolf, obviously. But Calgary is probably not going to be a good team. And Wolf has not been like that impressive at the nhl level so far so he's a bit dicier but so between those two i'd take wall but i think there's always going to be candidates for guys stealing starting jobs sometimes you just have to wait for it to actually happen because it's hard to guess that before the season sometime around november you start seeing someone like connor ingram taking starts and you just you ride him for as long as you can uh, being a goalie, uh, Cooper Black just signed with the Florida Panthers. If he plays to be the tallest goalie in NHL history, just the day after we saw Ivan Fedotov make his start, so mm-hmm. Cooper Black is six foot eight. So, uh, just fun fact there. Um, let's finish off here talking about something that isn't hockey. Um, your summer concert schedule. I know I'm seeing Green Day this summer in Detroit, and I'm hoping to go to that All Your Friends Fest in, in outside of Barrie. But what are you going to see yourself? Uh, so it's funny you mentioned Green Day because they are one of the headliners for Oceaga. And I've not been to a festival in a while because I'm 30 years old and that's a 20 year, <laughs> a 20 man uh, game. But the headliner, I've never seen Green Day live. I think it'd be a, an awesome thing because I love them growing up. SZA is one of the headliners. Didn't get to catch her in Toronto because concert tickets are expensive. And then I don't like Noah Khan, but my girlfriend does. So it feels like a, a good trio of headliners and the price of a festival pass is pretty much the same as going to see SZA. So, I mean, that could be the play, but don't have those passes yet. We'll see in August if I go. The only ticket I have booked right now is seeing the National and War on Drugs. I've already seen the War on Drugs last, I think two years ago now. They might have a new album coming. I'm not sure, but missed the National last year. I really want to see them. So had to had to check those guys out. All right, it's a good little lineup. I don't know if I've been to like a large show since before COVID. Little four times. I, yeah, I'm like I can't remember. I don't think I have, but I'm not a huge concert guy, so it's not like not, that's not a huge departure for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dom, before we let you go, great stuff as always. But uh, what do you have cooking on the Athletic right now? If anyone wants to look for something to read, uh, last week I just dropped an article saying that quality of competition is real after all. Who knew? Every hockey man ever. Um, I think it's, I think it's an interesting thing because a lot of models struggled to actually find its existence, and it's because when you look at like the absolute differences of like time on ice, if you look at Cider, his average skater is 14 minutes. Justin Hall is like 13 minutes. Like there's no gap there, so it made sense for the conventional analytics wisdom to be like it doesn't make a big difference because there's not a big difference. But they said the same thing about shot quality in the mid 2010s and that turned out to be a lie and what do you know the same thing is true about quality competition you just have to measure quality right and not use something hokey like ice time Mm -hmm. yeah it was a really good piece i read it as well and uh, also i i jumped over to apple tv and also watched you in uh, killers of the flower moon so you've been busy (laughs) dom DiCaprio, everybody uh thanks for coming on (laughs) Thanks for coming on. <laughs> always, always a good time. <laughs> I'll come on every time if you gas me up like that. <laughs> uh, thanks, buddy. Okay, thank you, Dommy. You are the man. Always a fun time having Dommy on. And let's move on now, Stephen, to our best bet of the week. And I'm looking at the game that everybody has circled this week just for pure entertainment value. The Edmonton Oilers and Colorado Avalanche will clash on April 5th. We have this Hart Trophy race reaching a fever pitch, and I don't know if I'm just getting caught up in, in the, the romanticism of it, but I'm just picturing McDavid and McKinnon just trying to one-up each other, kind of like back in the day that that playoff game between Crosby and Ovechkin mm-hmm. where they both got hat-tricks. I could just see something magical playing out because both of these players are the type. They have the flair for the dramatic, McDavid and McKinnon. So I think we're going to see a barn burner uh, between these two clubs. Colorado has at least four goals in six of their last 10 games. Edmonton, three or more goals in seven straight games. So the conditions are right for a slugfest, and I like the over 
The over is not being posted at the time of this podcast, but whatever it is, just I like it. So bet the over. <laughs> yeah. So now I, I want to see them fight. Let's let's see who. Look at yeah. both really can produce. We know who you know. McDavid's outproduced McKinnon for the most part, but McKinnon's been obviously as good as he has this year. Let's see who could actually win in a fight. I, I wouldn't be picking McDavid for that fight, but what no. your thoughts there? McDavid McKinnon fight, uh, or McDavid McDavid McKinnon two fight, like plus one hundred thousand would be what would, would be the odds of that happening? But do it. Be pretty Why not? <laughs> I'm pretty sure McDavid hasn't fought since he got hurt in junior, but you know. Why yeah, not? I think that's true. All right, let's move on now to uh, the prospect of the week, Stephen. And who are you looking at right now? I know you've had your close eye on the NCAA tournament, and I assume that's where this recommendation is going to come from. Lane Hudson, Montreal Canadiens. I think if you're a Canadiens fan, you kind of know what he's capable of this year. Uh, 15 goals in both of his seasons in the NCAA. 48 points last year, 49 this year. Uh, you know, one of the best under 20 defensemen we've ever seen at the college level. There, there are guys that put up more numbers back in the 70s and 80s, but back then, like college hockey was just not a good level of hockey. So, uh, it has really improved over time, and, and Hudson himself is looking great. I think the pure potential here for him to put up a ton of points in the NHL, it's got to get you excited. And I've been on record saying I thought he was a top 10, top 15 prospect when in that 2022 draft. So, for him to fall outside of the top 60 was unbelievable but you look at him and at the time you know five foot eight not great size he is five ten for the last uh measurements i've seen so he's actually added some size his defensive game has improved a lot that was another thing that was really kind of going against him where defensively he was a bit of a disaster at points last year in college but it's not the case anymore the boston terriers are uh are a very good team here in in college hockey i think everyone's looking at the eagles the boston college eagles as the team to beat right now cutter goche will smith ryan leonard gabe perot but celebrini and lane hudson those guys are really exciting to watch too but i do think boston university should be able to get to the final of the frozen four what happens here is once Boston University is eliminated, he is eligible to sign, Elaine Hudson is eligible to sign an NHL contract. So will we see him for maybe a game or two in the NHL? I, I think that's kind of what the, what the plan is here. That will burn a year of his entry-level contract, but I think that's kind of the reward you want to give for a guy who has been as good as he is because I believe Scott Morrow is the only defenseman that has more points over the last three years in college hockey. And he played a whole season more than Wayne Hudson did, and it's like really close. So with what Hudson's been able to do as a as a puck producer on the power play, do everything, he's he's going to be such a great fantasy defenseman in the NHL. Not going to block shots, not going to hit guys. That's not his game, but he's going to be just dynamite with the puck. I would love to see what he could do with someone like Arbor Jack guy who's out there to kill people. And then you got Hudson going out there to finish off the plays. I think that would be a really fun match or uh, lineup. Obviously you got David Reinbacher, who I think probably has another year or two to go before he's in the NHL, but Hudson, he should be a full-time player next year. So uh, I think that's exciting. And uh, Canadians fans, you know, it's going to get better pretty soon especially with the young defenseman you got coming up in the system and uh hey give him a forward to start passing to next year uh in the draft so uh yeah i like lane hudson excellent uh, i want to quickly put you on the spot if you were to rank long-term fantasy potential lane hudson versus david reinbacher versus logan mayu how would you rank the three lane hudson i just think you you know what he's been able to do at every level, it just the forwards just don't know how to handle it. Now the pro game is totally different, and the other two have played the pro game. I think Reinbacher is just not going to be putting up a ton of points in the NHL, and I'm still questioning if Mayu's got the overall game that's going to make him get the ice time that maybe Lane mm-hmm. Hudson's going to get in the NHL. So I think that I'm picking Lane Hudson as the guy. I just think that the, from a pure offensive standpoint he's untouched in that that category so uh yeah i like wait till he's passing to cole caulfield and then nick suzuki and guys like that like it's one thing to be passing to celebrini obviously as good as he is but wait till he's produce, sending it to, to caulfield and suzuki i think lane hudson's going to be putting up a ton of points in the nhl more than those other two nice it's going to be uh when you're watching the Habs power play with with hudson and caulfield out there it's going to look like uh, you're watching timbits timbits hockey at the intermission uh Hey, I'm small too, so you know I'm allowed to make that joke. Uh, okay, so Stephen, what do we have for questions this week? 
All right. So this question comes from Hunter Rankin, who says, you guys talked on a previous episode about Forsberg as a potential keeper for Steven. And if I'm correct, you told me to not keep him as opposed to Bedard. Um, but to elaborate more, how early would you pick him next year in a redraft? Yeah, it's a really tough question. And I went back, uh, Hunter, and looked at my preseason rankings. And I had ranked Forsberg pretty much the lowest I've had him since he established himself as an NHLer. And my words were, I'm out on him because he had missed double-digit games in five of the past six seasons going into this year. So I said, okay, I'm done. He's always hurt. And I was not very high on his value, where now we flash forward to the end of the season. He's having the best year of his career, 300 shots. He's going to crush all his career highs. He's already cleared 40 goals, 80 points, a couple weeks left in the season. So he's basically performed as like a top 25 player. Um, but I think you have to be careful to pay for this year's stats next year. Because if you look at the entire career, this healthy season – stands out to me it'll look more like an anomaly not the new norm uh so i'd still be skeptical that he can get through a, a full season without getting hurt again that said i i obviously have to bump him higher than 96 based on what he's shown and i think the way that first line is really clicked with nike fist and, and o'reilly i think that's the line right those three for most of the year in nashville it's been such a great year uh so to me i'd be willing to bump him up to maybe 60th overall give or take maybe 70th so if you're in a 12 team league it's the fifth round the end of the fifth round i'm still nervous to put him that much higher because again if you just go back and look at his career stats he's always hurt every year he gets hurt so you have to factor that in to his ranking that said what a year for philip forsberg no kidding i have him he's number seven in my league right now wow so he's He's been unbelievable. I, I I don't think anyone drafted him in my league. I think I picked him up on free agency like a week or two in the season. I picked him and Eli Tolvin in together, and uh, I dropped Tolvin in eventually. But Forsberg, whew, that worked out wow. for me. And he's uh, nine, he's ninth in my league. So yeah, it, so he's, he's, he's pretty good. good. Yeah, he's, he's pretty important. Uh, this one comes from Oren, who asks Byfield or Wyatt Johnson long term. Ooh, what a great question because uh, both guys have, have really shown so much this year. Um, so Wyatt Johnson uh, was drafted a year later, so that gives him a little edge in terms of the fact he's already producing more than Byfield and is younger. Uh, so I think if your league is goals or shots on goal heavy, you're going to want Wyatt Johnson just based on his profile. He's going to be more of a goal scorer. Um, and if I was declaring keepers right now in a league, I think I would pick Wyatt Johnston. Um, especially if let's say you're in a league with kind of contract limits, that kind of thing. You can only keep someone for a given number of years at a time. But based on what Byfield has shown this year, you can make a case that he has a bigger ceiling, a higher ceiling than Wyatt Johnson. I think Wyatt Johnson is going to be a great player. I think that he's not going to be a superstar, whereas Quint By Quentin Byfield, I don't think the conversation's over yet. It's conceivable that he could still become a superstar based on how much he has improved this year. So overall, safer pick, Wyatt Johnston. If you're looking for a superstar ceiling long term, you can make a case for Byfield. I think Wyatt Johnston is closer to his his ceiling right now. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that, that's kind of how I'm looking at it there. And he's a fantastic player and he's going to be have a very good long career, uh, the Dallas Stars, with Byfield. Again, as he continues to just get more comfortable out there, hit guys more, and just stay consistent, I'm I wouldn't be betting against him. So mm -hmm. that's I'm that's fair. At. That's right. Um, okay, Stephen, we're going to finish it off with the starting lineup, and this is maybe the weirdest one, but it it really just shows that we're getting close to the end of the fantasy season, and we've run through a lot of different starting lineups. So this one is a little weird, and I don't know why I want to know this, but uh, I want you to name. <laughs> Your starting lineup of the worst injuries you have suffered in sports. Okay, so I'll start with this one because it, it technically wasn't from a sport, but it impacted a pretty important sport weekend for me. And that was after playing, after doing some hockey uh, practice, I was going to a guitar store to get a new guitar amp and I closed a door on my middle finger that if you could see on the camera, it's still not straight. This was when I was like, 10 or 11 and uh i basically had to go play a hockey tournament the very first time i played with like an injury and i had to wrap my hand together i couldn't take part in the mini sticks in the in the hotel uh rooms that we were doing so it felt like i i kind of got to i missed out on the important part and i didn't play very well and really hard to grip a stick when you're like it, it, it hurts to break any finger but the middle finger is actually quite important for holding a stick mm -hmm. when that one's done doesn't help. Uh, the next one was uh, ball hockey. Uh, I broke my toe blocking a shot. Um, 
not a huge injury by any means. Uh, I, I like to block shots, but in ball hockey, you get those orange plastic balls. And like, I, I played pretty good, like ice hockey. I was fine, but, but it was ball hockey. I was definitely more competitive at definitely better at. And the ball, I blocked it with my foot and had to play the rest of the game with a broken toe. And that, that hurt a lot. Actually, it was very tough to run because at least if a broken toe in a skate, like, yeah, it hurts because you're, you're in close, but you're not using your toes to move. So, in uh, in ball hockey, you are using your foot. That hurts a lot, mm-hmm. so not a good time. Don't recommend it. My first concussion came in a go kart race on my birthday. I want to say I was nine, and it was my very first race I was ever leading. It was very exciting, and my engine blew in the cart. And I, the idea, the thing you're supposed to do is put your arm in the air to say, "Hey, like my car's broken or whatever," and I'm just like trying to get to a safe spot. And some kid behind me ran full speed into me, and I like these things go like. I want to say the kid carts were going 50 kilometers per hour, which is pretty quick for eight, nine, 10 year olds uh-huh. slam my head on the steering wheel. And that was what I was told was my first concussion. I actually don't recall too much about it. Um, this one, uh, second concussion was a follow through of a slap shot through uh, during a ball hockey game. I was playing oh. goalie and a uh, guy went to take a shot. Uh, he completely missed the ball, but hit me in the head instead with his stick that hurt. I did drive home that day. Uh, and I was okay enough to do that. And it wasn't until the next day. I'm like, Oh, yeah, this isn't good. So I missed a couple of days of school. Uh, that was okay. It was worth it. Uh, next one. Uh, yet again, another ball hockey one. Uh, I uh, twisted my ankle, but had to finish because we were already short players. And I believe uh. this was one where it was like March break and we still had to play a game. And there was like, you know, maybe it wasn't March. It was sometime in the summer, I guess. And it was like, I want to say we had enough for one full line and two reserve players. And it was like, a, it was a quarterfinal game. And I was set to play goalie the next game, but I was playing player this game. And we went, we ended up winning that game. And then the next day we won the semifinals and we were, it was awesome because we beat the top team in the league. And then we got destroyed on the, in the championship game. Cause eventually having six and seven guys um, per game was not exactly the way to kind of make it work. Uh, and my final one was actually kind of a pretty brutal one. Uh, it was a go-kart crash that actually still has its impacts today. I think I was 11 or 12 and I spun to avoid another cart and, uh, and it was fine. I was good. But then another cart, he lost control trying to avoid us he hit me directly in the knee and i end up having uh knee injury like knee issues basically for about the next 15 ish years and it wasn't until a couple years ago where it finally like didn't hurt to walk anymore on that leg so uh that that impacted trying to play butterfly and hockey and impacted a lot of things and uh, i do not recommend having a go-kart drive right into the middle of your knee so yeah, I've actually had a bunch of decent injuries. Nothing that was too crazy that took me out. I actually, like, in all of these, I ended up not missing much time at all. But uh, I've had enough of uh, the stupid. I'll, I'll finish off with one thing. The stupidest injury I ever had was when I dropped uh, my guitar on one pinky toe. And half an hour later, I dropped a phone book off my onto my other pinky toe. And the phone books, like, remember <laughs> those things? They're not small. Yeah, yeah. It was like the corner went right in the middle of my pinky. I could not <sighs> walk on my toe, foot. That hurt actually a lot. So that was my stupidest injury. Wow, that was quite a list. And I think the main takeaway is uh, don't go go-karting, kids. Because <laughs> that sounds like you've gotten some harrowing situations, but glad you're mostly okay now. Uh, I will say a- this. I will say this. The go-karts have become a lot safer over time, which is nice. Okay, that's good. Good to know. Uh, it's funny. Most of mine, I won't get into them now, but most of mine are, I've had a lot of injuries, but most of them are just from weird freak non-sports things. We have a, a couple bad sports ones, but a couple just that have nothing to do with sports that are so weird. Uh, but that's a conversation for another day. And that is it for this episode, Steven. And before we let you go, we do have a small announcement for everybody. Uh, this is nearing the end of the run of puck poolies. Uh, we're not going to stop podcasting as we continue to plug away at Daily Face Off, but we are going to be moving on and doing something different next year. So the next episode of Puck Poolies will be the final episode, the series finale, if you will. So hopefully you enjoy it. Hopefully you've enjoyed this entire run over the past couple of years. And don't worry, Stephen and I are not going anywhere. We're just changing it up next year with the type of shows we're going to be doing. So thanks for listening.